Angular JS mug.org February JavaScript framework from Google. And it's uh, used for when we want to build these sort of rich web applications like uh, Google Maps or Gmail, that sort of thing, right? These uh, applications that really aren't really web pages anymore, right? <laughs> They're more of like just applications that happen to be running in your browser using HTML and CSS. Oh, and before we get started, if you guys have any questions, feel free just to like yell them out, raise your hand, whatever. And I'm happy to try to answer them just during a important presentation. So, to get started, let's talk about what the problem Angular is trying to solve is. So, back when HTML was born in like, uh, the early 1990s or so, it was uh, really <coughs> tough to envision the sort of documents and applications we have today, right? Like, in 1993, no one really could have seen Google Maps coming or Google or, uh, <laughs> right. or like, was it Google Docs, any of that sort of stuff. <coughs> so, HTML is great at describing static documents, right? Uh, if we wanted to have paragraphs or headings, images, that sort of thing, right? HTML is amazing at doing sort of semantic markup like that. But it comes, it becomes really hard when we want to build these like rich web applications, right? We're using JavaScript, we're using HTML, and sort of trying to marry the two, but we can run into problems if we're just using plain old HTML and plain old JavaScript. And our users are really starting to uh, expect these sort of rich applications, right? In the age of like Facebook and that sort of thing, right? Uh, they're getting used to this idea that they don't have to wait for a full page load between every single application. And creating these uh, between every single like uh, new request. And creating these large web applications can be a real pain. So just to sort of demo that, I have an example application here. So this is a little web application. And uh, we can type and see just as we type, it's basically uh, updating this label down here. Right? So, we can say like, uh, Hello, cool. so this is not a <coughs> complex application by any stretch of the imagination. Right? We basically have our input, and we want the value from the input to show up uh, on the HTML page. And this is the sort of uh, code that might power something like this, right? just in plain old JavaScript. We have a couple lines of code here. We have a uh, just our typical input box and a paragraph tag that we're putting our text in. And then in our JavaScript, we're sort of scanning the document for the input box, right? We're scanning the document and uh, getting uh, the label that we're going to be putting the HTML in. We're attaching an event listener uh, for when the, whenever the user lets go of a key, right? Uh, that's this key up right here. And then we have a callback saying, take the value of the text box and set it into the label's uh, text. That's how we're achieving this sort of uh, functionality like this. And so this is okay, right? Yeah, you can do some things like use jQuery to make it a few less lines of code, right? But it's basically still the same thing, right? Uh, we have a lot of code where we're looking for elements, right? Manually updating the uh, web page. And it can get really, really hairy when we try to make a more complicated web page, right? As soon as we start adding AJAX requests and updating multiple parts of the page, it can get pretty complex pretty quickly. You can get into those sort of like uh, spaghetti code or callback hell, as it's sometimes called. <laughs> we just have all these sort of callbacks, like uh, this function here is a callback, right? Uh, callbacks calling other callbacks, and things can sort of collapse under their own weight uh, pretty quickly. <laughs> so AngularJS has sort of a three-pronged solution for this. Uh, the first thing it uh, adds is a model view controller architecture. We're going to get a little bit more into exactly what that is uh, in a bit. It's basically an architecture that helps you keep all your concerns separate, right? You can uh, keep the business logic of your application separate from the HTML you're using to display the results of that business logic. The second thing it introduces is data binding. And data binding is a nice concept. It basically gets rid of all that boilerplate code we saw on the previous slide where we're sort of searching for elements and then manually updating them. The third thing it does is it actually extends HTML uh, to provide new attributes and HTML tags that are useful 
for uh, dynamic web applications like uh, we create nowadays. So just to give you a sense of sort of what this looks like, uh, here's the same little web application, this time done with Angular, right? So we have the uh, same thing. And so this is all the code for the application in Angular. Uh, of course, there's an AngularJS library we're including on the page as well. But you see, we just have uh, two lines, which is basically our markup. So we have our input tag and our paragraph tag again. We have a couple of new attributes that AngularJS is adding. We have this ng model. And so ng stands for sort of the ng in Angular. They prefix all their uh, custom attributes with ng. And so we're saying the model for this input is the variable name. And then our label, we have this curly brace syntax saying output the variable name. So then as we update our input tag, it's updating the variable name, and then that uh, name is being displayed up here. And so this is the concept uh, I mentioned earlier called data binding, right? It's uh, binding to variables. And various parts of our application are binding to uh, variables. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the model view controller architecture that AngularJS has. So this model view control diagram is just straight from Wikipedia. It's a fairly standard architecture, especially in the sort of UI-based applications, where we have our user, and then he's looking at a view, right? He's looking at the web application, the HTML that we're uh, creating. Uh, behind that is the model, which is the data for our application, whether it's coming from a database or a uh, web service call, that sort of thing. And uh, that model is being that model, as we change it, it updates the view. And then if you want to interact with the view, right, uh, the user can call various, uh, the user can be, perform various actions using the controller to update the model. So this is sort of uh, the abstract concept of a model view controller. To sort of bring it uh, closer to Angular, I have the same sort of diagram, uh, but with some Angular specifics in here. Uh, so we have our same old like model, view, and controller here. Uh, and then we have our user that's interacting so again, you can see this uh, user is interacting with the view, which is just HTML. Uh, that view is associated with the model, uh, which via data binding, whenever the model updates, the view updates. And then we have a controller, which can update the model. And the controller can update the model by initially getting the data. So for example, maybe it calls out to a web service and then gets some uh, data back and puts that in the model. And then it can also update the model if the user performs an action. Say they submit a form or something like that, or uh, click a link or click a button, that sort of thing. That'll actually call functions on the controller, which will then update the model. So that's the general sort of interaction model that we have. So as I mentioned before, the view is just HTML, right? We saw that when we were, uh, had that input form. Uh, the controller is just a normal, normal JavaScript function, right? There's uh, no like uh, special Angular JS stuff we have to extend, right? That's just normal uh, JavaScript function. And the model is interesting. The model has this uh, dollar sign scope object. Basically, the dollar sign scope object is just an uh, empty object, and any data we put into that object is then available for the view to render. And so let's drive this home a little bit by looking at some actual code. So this application right here, let's say I have it up and uh, running somewhere here, which have a My Favorite Things app, right? Uh, so we're just displaying a list of My Favorite Things, Linux, AngularJS, and Uniforms. And so you can see this is the code behind that application. So the first thing we're doing is we're defining a controller. In this case, it's the Favorites controller. Uh, and it basically just holds a list of our favorite things. So we have this uh, scope object right here to be passed into our controller. And we just populate on the scope object things that we want the view to display. So in this case, we're hard coding an array of three objects, right? Uh, we have our Linux, AngularJS, and Unicorns. So that's the controller, and this is the model. So that's like the model controller part of the MVC. Last up is the view, which in this case is just our body tag. So we have body is our uh, view in this case. We're associating that with the controller. And then within our view, we have access to everything that we put on the scope object. So in this case, favorite things is an array. So we're looping through that array and outputting a list element for each item in the array. And then just outputting that item. 
And so then we have one other little minor tag right there, uh, that ng app. That's basically telling Angular where our app begins. And so in this case, our entire web pages and applications are putting on the root HTML tag. But uh, if you wanted to have that maybe just be a subsection of your application, you could put that on any HTML element you wanted. So we're going to dive a little bit into the controller now. So we have this controller right here. You see we passed in this dollar sign scope, and it's almost a little bit of magic, right? That like uh, we just put this in as a function parameter and AngularJS knew what to give us. So AngularJS is looking at the names of the variables that we're requesting in our controllers. And then there are several well-defined names. And so for dollar sign scope, it knows it should give us this scope object that populates and then will be, then it makes the data on that scope object available to the viewer. And so this uh, pattern is called dependency injection. So basically we're not uh, instantiating our objects uh, in our uh, controller. We're just putting our dependencies as parameters and AngularJS is in charge of giving us uh, those dependencies. There's a couple of other things besides scope we can use. For example, we can use a dollar sign log and AngularJS will uh, inject a uh, log variable that gives us like debug logging and error logging and uh, warning logging. Uh, we could ask for maybe a uh, HTTP object and then we can make uh, AJAX requests from this controller using uh, this sort of syntax where we say make a get request to this API URL and then on success execute this function with the data returned from that URL. So to use all three of these together, we could do something like this, where we uh, say just want to get our favorite things from an API as opposed to hard coding them. We can say, we'll go ahead and debug that we're about to make an AJAX call, make an AJAX call, log that we got the response, and then set the favorite things uh, variable on our scope to the favorites that we got back from that API call. All right, and so we talked a little bit about uh, model, the scope. We can put uh, various uh, pieces of data on our scope to make them available to the view. So we saw before we can have an array, we can have a string, we can really have any sort of JavaScript object we want. We can also have uh, functions, for example. So this is how the user could click something on the view, or right? maybe click a button or something like that, and then interact with the uh, controller and the model behind the scenes. So we have our favorite things array here, and we have an add favorite function we're defining that just pushes our new favorite thing onto the favorite things array. So let's go ahead and take a little uh, look at this. So we have this uh, same view before where we had a list of our favorite things. So we had our favorite things variable that was an array, and we're just outputting all of our favorite things. And now we have two new elements. We have our input box and we have a button you see right here and our input box is uh, putting its value into the new favorite variable and then the button click is calling add favorite with our new favorite variable so we can say something like uh, LXC is one of our new favorite things uh, we can go ahead and put Linux here and uh, I guess I'll put unicorn support and I guess I suppose we <laughs> All right, suppose. <laughs> so this is how we uh, can get interactivity in our application, where you can read the data, and then we can also write to the data. So you can see this is how if you want to have a form or a search box, something like that, right? This is the same basic structure you would have. So we have our view, we have our various data binding, we have some of the custom attributes that AngularJS adds, and then uh, behind the scenes, we had our controller that was defining uh, various functions and data that uh, we used. So that was covering the main three things of AngularJS, right? Uh, we have the model view controller, we have uh, data binding, and we have extending HTML with various attributes. Uh, there's one more thing I want to cover real quick, which is routing, which is moving between controllers. So routing is not part of core AngularJS. But pretty much any application out there is going to need routing because you're going to have more than sort of one page, right? You're going to want the user to be able to click between various different things. So 
Right? As I said, routing not part of the core Angular, right? Basically, it associates a URL with a controller and a view. So as the user navigates through your application by clicking various URLs, it swaps out the controller and the view so the user can see, so you can uh, basically transition between different areas of your application. And really, the best way to demonstrate this is just to go ahead and build an application with AngularJS. So let's go ahead and uh, do that. So I have a simple API here running on uh, port 80. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of uh, clone DistroWatch, right? So DistroWatch is like an old, venerable application, right? Uh, I'm sure most of us have experience with it. It's basically just sort of a uh, list of Linux distributions, and then you can click into a Linux distribution, get a screenshot and some more information about uh, the specific distribution that you clicked on. So I just have like a, I have a very basic API here. So I can go to API slash distros and get uh, just some summary information about a bunch of Linux distributions. So for example, we have Ubuntu, we have the Ubuntu logo, and then we just have a quick summary of uh, Ubuntu. And then this is, Ubuntu is ID1. So if we go to API distros slash one, <coughs> then we get some more detailed information about that uh, distribution, right? For example, now we have a description, we have a screenshot, uh, we have some stats. That's one of the things that DistroWatch uh, tracks, sort of like uh, the hits per day. So we have uh, that information. So we can go ahead and start uh, building an AngularJS application using this API. See that okay in terms of font size? Yay, Kylie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, here we just have sort of an empty uh, page, right? As we go, we just see this like a, a mug distro watch uh, sort of thing. We're including our Angular uh, JS application. So the first thing we want to do is call into this uh, summary API. And just to sort of to get something on the page, let's go ahead and uh, display a list of all the distributions we have at our disposal. So I'm going to go ahead and make a controller called uh, distro list controller, and it's going to uh, make an HTTP request out to the API, and it's going to take the response of that and just put it on the scope, so then we can print it out in the view. So that's. Uh, Pretty straightforward. We're making a get request to our URL, which is API slash distros. And then once we get back a response of the distros, we're just going to go ahead and put that on the scope variable. Right, so uh, we'll just call that distros and take the variable we got back from the web API call and put that on the uh, distros object. So now we want to go ahead and output it. So uh, just like we saw some in some of the code examples, for now our body is just going to be the view. distro in our distros list. Is versus in. So distros, oh, thank you, in distros. Let's go ahead and just output distro dot name. And if I've done everything correctly, let me refresh this page. Okay, there's our uh, list of distributions uh, coming back from our API. And so we also have uh, some various things we could do, like uh, this is just our distro object that's coming straight from our API. So we have access to, say, the summary. Uh, so let's go ahead and just put that in a uh, p tag or something. Refresh 
and now we have our uh, information coming uh, from the Okay. So now, the next thing we want to do is we want to have some sort of uh, link, right? Uh, so when, when we say click Ubuntu or something like that, right? Uh, we go into the uh, information uh, about uh, that distribution. So we're going to go ahead and do that via another controller. So right now we have a distro list controller. Let's go ahead and make a singular uh, distro controller for looking at one Linux distribution. It's going to be pretty similar in that uh, we are going to be making an AJAX request and putting the result on the scope. So I should just go ahead and uh, grab this real quick. It's going to be a different URL, which I'll get to in a second. Right? Uh, we're going to be doing something there, right? Because you have to somehow get that ID so we can pull up the specific distro. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, it's going to be a very similar structure, right? Uh, we're just going and getting the information and uh, outputting it. So this is where uh, the uh, part, this is where the uh, routing comes in that I mentioned uh, before. So like I said, that's part of, uh, not part of core Angular, right? Uh, that's just uh, an extension. So let's see, that's Angular route that we'll pull in. Yeah, so it's from the core Angular team. And up until about a version ago, like up until maybe, I think maybe two months ago, it was shipped as part of core Angular. But they've actually sort of uh, split that out, and so now you only pull it in if you need it. Uh, but most applications do end up needing it. So we're going to have to go ahead and actually pull, sort of register that plugin with our application. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and give our uh, module a name, let's call it. Uh, just for watch. We're going to say it uses the ng route plugin. So at this point, we've pulled in our uh, routing plugin, and we just need to configure it, right? We somehow need to map these URLs to the various controllers and use. So we're going to do that uh, like this with a function saying we have a route provider. So this route provider object is what we use to actually configure and map our URLs. So we can say, like, uh, we want to map the root URL to the controller uh, distro list controller. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, uh, let's say when we're at the uh, distro slash ID URL. going to pull up the distro control. And so this ID variable right here, this sort of placeholder, is how is what we're going to use here to replace this uh, sort of unknown that we had earlier. Uh, so it's uh, Rio route params. We're going to, that's another thing that uh, Angular knows how to inject. And so now we said we're using uh, dollar sign ID as our placeholder. So we can uh, replace this question mark with route params.id. And so now when our distro list controller, or I'm sorry, when our distro controller is navigated to via this URL, this ID placeholder, the value that's there in the URL, will then be on our route params object for our ID. And then there's one last thing right now. <laughs> We just have our view just straight up in the uh, body of the document, right? And since we have two controllers, we're going to need two views, right? Uh, one to display the list of Linux distributions, and one to display the actual uh, uh, Linux distribution uh, details. So right here, we're associated with the controller. We're also going to uh, type in a view URL. And I actually have these views existing, so you, want, you guys don't have to watch me like, write HTML and CSS. <laughs> uh, let's see, I think it's at uh, templates, distro list, templates, uh, distro. Uh, okay. 
fourth thing we have to do is we have this, we named our application now. We named it uh, DistroWatch. So just to the side, we have to say our app is now DistroWatch. That's just like a little gotcha there. So by default, if you have just a single unnamed application in Angular, it just assumes that's the application you want. As soon as you start naming things, right, then you have to configure and say, okay, let me, now I want to use this uh, DistroWatch uh, application. Right. And, uh, now we're going to see how well I did this from memory. Hmm. Oh, no, oh, that's one more thing. So right now, uh, we're, yeah, we're, we still have our own, like our template right here, right? Uh, so we're going to go ahead and just put a div. We're going to use this ng view attribute, and Angular will know uh, when we navigate to our controller, it knows what the view template is. It'll take whatever our view template is, fill in with the data, and then plug that into ng view. <coughs> Distros API call. Oh, I think I know what the I probably have this uh, AngularJS uh, routing. Uh, Instead of the uh, URL, yeah. we have a template URL. Hey, there we go. Okay. Uh, so now we have uh, this. I have some custom CSS going on uh, as well. Yeah, so we set all the same uh, colors and <laughs> right, right, right. It's a little bit of magic. We can create a template. We can take a look at uh, the templates. So uh, here's our distro list, right? Uh, this is, so this is the template we're using for the distro uh, list. You can see it's, sort of the, it's basically the same thing we had earlier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the core issue is we have this ng repeat mm -hmm. for each distro in our distros collection that's on our controller. Now we're just outputting some actual, we're outputting the image, for example, that we're getting back from our API call. But we still have the name and the summary, and I have some CSS behind the scenes that's actually doing some stuff now. So you see we have this uh, read more link, and then we're saying the link to it is slash distro slash, we have a distro.id, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that's what we define. Uh, in our uh, distro. May I have your attention? The time is now 8.30 and the library will be closing at 30 minutes at 9 p.m. Please be advised that the internet connections will shut down approximately 10 minutes before closing. Thank you. Okay, so that link is basically just triggering this route, right? Uh, so when they click on that link, the browser just navigates to distro slash ID, and that's going to sub in the distro control. So go ahead and give that link. A link, just click. Uh, let's see, and so there's another issue. So did clicking that link actually do a get? Uh, clicking that link, you can see we're doing uh, this hash symbol right there in the URL. Oh, okay. uh, so that is actually not right. fully reloading the page, right? Uh, AngularJS is intercepting that since it's a URL right. fragment. Okay. Uh, there is an HTML5 uh, navigation uh, mode as well. So then you can use some HTML5 features to get rid of this like uh, hash mark right there in the URL change. Yeah, so let's see. Yeah. 